Here's your drill. So you got yourself the 18 inch gear tie. You're doing that. You're out on the putting green. You're doing some drills. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to make sure that you hit one handed putts with your trail hand. And we're going to go this way. We're going to feel like we're doing this. We're not going to do this. We're going to push the handle. And so when we push the handle, now all of a sudden, look at the speed of that putt. Not a lot of room in that hole and it finds it, okay? So you get the, the, the drill on the putting green and I would not recommend hitting that putt one-handed with, uh, on, on a putt more than 10 feet. I would, I would stay at 10 feet and possibly less, maybe even you know three, four feet. But you're just one hand. I, again, I've gone to this, um, to this lead hand low. If you, if you decide that you're gonna go traditional like this, then you're gonna feel the exact same thing. It's gonna be push out of that, out of that trail hand. Again, very good speed and it finds the hole there. And I'm gonna feel my club coming in and missing that heel tee and hitting the, the tee that the ball is on in the center of the club face. Oh yeah, I peppered that one. That one there was, that was flush in the center of the club face. Spin rate on that is really good. Get out there. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I love golf balls that listen. Now let's look at our, let's look at all of our information here because this is really exactly what I'm trying to get. Now I have a pitching wedge. I know when I hit my pitching wedge hard that it tends to draw a little bit, but I don't have anything to worry about over on the right-hand side unless I hit it too far. My pitching wedge isn't going to go 140 yards. It's not going to go into that bunker on the right-hand side. And I don't want to be there in the first place. I want to get this thing on the green. I want to, I want to be able to be aggressive with this shot. I, I don't want to be defensive. If I pull a nine iron out here and I have to take distance off it, now all of a sudden I'm bringing back left into play. And back left into play is where there's a penalty area. And I don't want to do that. So I go with a pitching wedge. Hit this thing a little bit harder. Maybe even tow it in a little bit if you want to. I don't, but you can. And now we go. So there you go. This one's even a little bit harder. Now watch what happens to this one. Right at the flag, has a little drawback. Love the shot. Never brought myself, never put myself in any harm's way. I actually hit that farther than my 135. I hit it 138, but it was hit so hard and had so much backspin that it spun back. Had a nice little draw to it. Gibbsy, pull up that, that trace of that shot. I made a great decision. Welcome to a new breed of golf live inside the Morgan Franklin Transformation Center. Excited to be with you on another Thursday. They're playing in my island. That's exactly right. They're on the island of, of Bermuda at the Butterfield Bermuda Championship. We had a 61 shot this morning from Alex Noren. He made 11 birdies and one bogey. I have not done that, but it's a great golf course and, and uh, love watching golf in Bermuda. So excited to be able to, to help you improve your game today. We're going to talk about something really important. I'm calling it an essential, something that every single golfer, no matter what level you're at, Every single golfer needs to do this and will improve from doing this. What is it? Hip depth. But I'm going to come at it from a slightly different angle. So we're going to talk about that today. Before we get to all that, I want to remind you of a couple of little different things. One, we've got our blessed poker chip ball markers here. We just sent six over to Scotland. It's exactly right. And a hat. But we sent six of our blessed poker chip ball markers over to Scotland. Get your one. Send an email to me at a new golf at michaelbreed.com. They're only six bucks. You love them. I'm telling you, you love them. And by the way, when you have to move that coin, make sure you flip it over. You got that American flag. Somebody in Scotland getting an American flag one's fantastic. There's some other things that we've got going on as well. You want to be a part of the program. You want to be part of the community. You can pick yourself up a, a hat or a putter cover. We've got them in various styles, various colors. So if you're a mallet, if you're a... Um, if, if you've got a blade style putter, you can get that as well. And you can see the hats down there in that lower... Uh, left-hand corner, you get a look at, at the opportunities there with the hat. So great gifts, particularly this time of year. Just send an email to me at a newbreedagolf at michaelbreed.com. 
The other thing I want to talk to you about, and this is a cool thing we've got going on. This is your design your own golf shoe. That's right. With FootJoy, we have, have come up with this, with this plan. You go over to FootJoy, go to my joys, and we've got a couple uh, on the set here for you. Take a peek at that. I've designed those too. You can put a little USA in the heel. You can put something else. Different styles of, of shoes, Packards. We also have Wilcox. They've got Tarlo. There's a lot of different options. Check out the shoes that I've got that I'm sporting right now. I told you they were in Bermuda. Don't you love that pink? But you can also put those stars back there. Be a five-star general. That's what I've got going on. These are the shoes that I'm sporting today just for, for uh, the fact that the PGA Tour is on the island of Bermuda, and I love going there. One of my favorite places in the world. Now, before we get to all of how to do that, here's what you do. You go over to footjoy.com and then click the my joys that's when you get to start to des to design your shoe and there are literally thousands millions of options of how you can do this between the different shoes the shoelaces the different little things that you can put on you can put like we put usa on this we've been messing around with some other shoes and some other i designed my randolph making shoes which they'll be coming i'll show you those uh very soon but the Randolph making shoes, we got a little black, we got a little yellow. We didn't get the bumblebee, but we do have RMC on there. So you can put um, your school initials or whatever it is that you want to put on there, design your own shoe. And then at the start of 2024, we're going to look at all the, the contestants. So you got to get those shoes. You got to order them, send them to you, take a picture, send that picture to me at a new breed of golf at michaelbreed.com. And the winner is going to get a half an hour lesson with me inside the studio. You're going to send your video. We'll zoom you in half an hour. We're going to help you improve your game. And then also, too, there's going to be 10 other individuals that are going to get a dozen uh, gloves from FootJoy. Now, the, the grand winner is going to get uh, the lesson. They'll also get the gloves. And Chris Finn from Par for Success is going to throw in three months of training. So it's a really, really nice package. I can't tell you what the value is at, but... It's nearly $1,000. So it's a wonderful package. Make sure you become a part of this, this program. Get online at footjoy.com and then go to My Joys and start designing your shoes. Get those shoes ordered up. It takes about three or four or five weeks to get those shoes. You've got until the 15th of uh, December to get those pictures to me at a new breed of golf at michaelbreed.com to get the entry in. And then, of course, um, in, in early January there, we're going to let everybody know who won all the different, uh, different prizes. So lots of cool things that are going on. Now, before we get to shooting the show, I want to introduce you to the guys behind the scenes, as we always do, Steve Gibbs over to the left and Greg Ducharme and wow. Oh, they had it all figured out. And then Gibbsy went open hand and Greg didn't go there. Live television. That's what we got. Now I want to talk to you about hip depth and what you can see gives you if you could pull this full so you can see what this looks like i've got a brace back here because i'm going to put some real pressure against this wall and what i want you to realize is this when you practice i want you to practice against a wall without a golf club so let me show you how you're going to practice this we talk about hip depth but what it really has to do with is how your chest works so what you're going to do is you're going to cross your hands across your your shoulders and then you get set up go ahead down the line there Gibbsy. you get set up with your with your rear up against the wall and then what i want you to do is i want you to rotate back i want you to keep that right cheek on it on that wall rotate down get that left cheek on there and then get that left hip and what you can see when you do that is check out my my trail heel my right heel is down low it's not up here this way it's down low through there because I've created this, this uh, side bend, trail side bend. And then you're going to come up here into that finish. But you're still going to have pressure in that lead hip on the wall. No sliding on that. Now, how do we teach ourselves to have hip depth? Well, you can think about it with your hips. But what I prefer to think about is taking my chest and dropping my chest down to my thighs here. So what I want to feel is I want to feel when I'm back here that my chest is now coming down to my thighs and the angle between my chest and my thighs, it decreases. Now I want to show you something over here. So we're going to go over here to the, 
v1 and i want you to take a look at tiger woods here because this is what i think makes made and makes tiger so special he's the very best that i have ever seen at this particular um part of the golf swing creating depth of hips the best of anybody that i've ever seen but the key is how he compresses his chest against the thighs or towards the thighs so i've drawn this line on the back of of his rear there take him up to the top and what you can see is, is that his right hip has gone past that wall now what i want you to pay attention to is this because this is really the key to to tiger so those are the angles i want you to see the top of the head watch how the head is going to drop i want you got the face so there's his face how that's going to going to move but i want you to pay special attention to this right here the angle that his back upper body is at relative to the thighs and i want you to watch how when he starts to come down look at look at what happens this angle that's right in here watch how this is going i'm going I'm to take all these out and i'm going to draw this in here again so here and here now watch how he goes down look at how that angle has now changed now it's here and there so the angle changes ever so slightly but it's enormous you see that move now pay attention to this because this is where it's very powerful watch that head dropping it also as it drops and he's trying to hit a draw here so he's working underneath it a little bit his head is moving back and away so what you can see is you see the hat right there now watch how he goes see how it's moving back and away right there now that's going to allow the club head to come from the inside so that's how tiger is getting the club to the inside at a, at a at a shot or at a time where he's trying to hit a draw but what i also want you to pay attention to is this so i bring him back back to address i put that back up there at the top of the swing the hip is broken the wall as he comes down to to impact look at where that that trail hip is it's right there on that line now all of a sudden here shows up the the left cheek back past that line so he's broken that wall and then when he comes through to the strike he's still pushing he's pushing up but he's also pushing back and when he does that now he's able to stay in that strike and look at where his head is. So he starts out up here. He drops down at an impact. His head is now at this height right here. At address, his head is all the way up here. So it's moved from here to here into the impact. And the reason why is, is that his butt has pushed back that way. And the reason why that is, is because his chest has driven down to the ground it's opening but it's driven down to the ground that's the power of what what happens now what i want you to look at is in the face on view now this is a different swing but it's the same swing and by the way sunday red he's playing good golf that's what's going on this is a warm-up it's you can see he's just got a small basket of balls there and this basket that's back over here is a basket that he's already hit so he's just warming up he's getting ready to play an important round of golf clearly in the red it's sunday this isn't thursday it's not a practice round so what i want you to see is is that not only is that head going to drop down as we talked about before so that head drops down but it moves forward watch this again that head is here he starts loading it's dropping down it's moving forward and now he starts rotating and there's a little backward movement right there and it comes back now why is that all important because what you have to realize in a face-on view is when you start to take your chest and compress it to your thighs the head will move forward so as I start thinking about taking my chest and going down to my thighs, my head moves forward. I call it a bow. 
So what we're doing is we're bowing. And when I bow, let's go down the line here, Gibbsy. When I go and I bow, I'm going to drop my body down. But as I bow from a rotated spot, and now I get into a bow, now go face on. When I go rotated, and now I go into a bow this way, you can see how my head is now going to go lower and forward. And now what also happens too is my tail is now going back. So here's how you're going to practice this. And, and we've had a number of people say, you know, I love this. How do I practice this? So let's go down the line. You take a pillow. You're going to, you're going to hug that pillow. What you're going to notice is there's space between my thighs and the bottom of this pillow. What I want to do here is I want to bow until I feel that pillow touch my thigh there. And the question would be, well, how much pillow should there be? I'm looking at like five, six inches from my from my belt line to the bottom of the pillow, right? So right there, great shot, Gibbsy. So now we bow, and now it hits. And what you'll notice is, is that as that starts to happen, my tail goes back. Go back to that shot again, Gibbsy, if you would. So look at how much space is between that, that butt board and my butt, and now I go like this, and it goes back. That's what Tiger does. Okay, so now pull it full. And now what you see is that I'm going down this way. Now, the fun part about this is this. If you pay attention, in fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to record this. That's what I'm going to do. What I want you to do is I want you to watch this. So I'm going to just get over here like this. And then I'm just going to bow like that. I'll do it again like that. Now. I want you to watch this here, okay? So there's a spot that's like in the mid back, right about there, that when I start to bow, it just drops straight down. So the upper part of my chest is going forward. My rear is going backward. And this part right here is going is not moving forward or backward necessarily it's just kind of moving down so what you're seeing is just a downward a downward motion right there that's where my hinge is coming from right there you see that okay and so that's what i want you to 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 do to teach yourself how to do this and this is where having a mirror at your house Let's go down the line again. Having a mirror at your house, holding that pillow, paying attention to this, and then bowing. So you start teaching yourself to bow. Then what I want you to do is I want you to turn, and from the turn, I want you to bow. Because what I want you to get used to is the feeling of what's going on in your lead foot. Because when you turn, this lead hip is now going to bring weight out to the toe side of that lead foot. So when I get over here and then I bow, now all of a sudden I feel weight going from toe to heel uh, in the lead foot. So I'm going here and I'm going there. Now, if you're fortunate enough to be able to A, build a contraption like this, and then B, have a space that you can hit into, now what I want you to do is I want you to hit some balls, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to feel the bow. Now, here's what you need to understand. We're going to, we're going to look at path here. And we're going to look at how the club comes into the golf ball and the consistency of it. So when I do this, and this is something that I did um, yesterday and the day before and even today, before the show and before the radio show. What's amazing to me is the consistency of the path of the golf club. It's somewhere between when I overdo it i'll get it up into the fives but when i do it with just what i'm you know just a normal swing i'll get a three degree path that's going a little bit out to in i like to hit cuts i want that path to go out to in just because you bow doesn't mean that you're going to hit uh, a, a, a cut or a draw it it literally depends on where you're bowing okay so i want you to understand that now so here's 
rear up against the butt board. Now I'm just going to chip this and I feel the, the bow. Now I came off of that a little bit on the through, which is something that I've, I've got to work on. But if we go over here and we hang on to this, what you're going to see is there's the, the path out to in is 5.5 degrees. So this is just doing it slowly and simply giving it a, a an overdue to make sure they get this. I told you, I'm going to be between three, six, three, five, 5.5. I'm in. What I don't want is in to out. I can play golf with two degrees out to in, uh, even one degree out to in. It's not what I prefer, but I can. But the point is I can't have in to out because if I have an open face and I have an in to out path, I got a problem. So that one is not that. Let's do it again. And I won't walk over there. You all can just take a peek at it. So here, I got to do a little better job with getting my hip on that. So here, there. Now you can see those two golf balls are relatively identical. I mean, same distance, same line, and the path of the club, a little bit more exaggerated, 7.2. Fine. I don't care. In this particular drill, I don't care. What I care about is, is that it's out to in. Now, when I start swinging, it never gets to seven. It'll get to, it'll get to like somewhere between two and, and uh, four. So this will be a swing. I'm not putting my rear up against that. I'm giving my space. I hit it. So I pushed back because I was really bowing and working on that. Now, what's my path going to be here? I, I swung a little bit faster. And there you go. So hold that one, Greg. Yeah. So what you see is, remember I told you, like, I'm right at about 3, 2.7. You can't really get much closer than that right there. And that's what I see with my shot shape. Really good strikes. Really solid out of the center of the club face. And what happens when you get this hip depth, you get a couple of little different things. One, you get a consistency of path in the club, which is what you're starting to see. You also get a consistency in the strike point because I start to hit this golf ball. And I'm not just talking about toe heel. I'm talking about wear on the face. Many of you, when you hit it uh, in not solidly, you're going to hit it high in the grooves. But what I'm getting when I do this now is I get the, the contact around the second or third groove right in here. So when I get that second or third groove contact, now, all of a sudden, my spin rates start to get really consistent, which means what, what I'm going to get is consistency in the trajectory, consistency in the flight, consistency in the carry, consistency in how, it, how the green receives the golf ball. All that stuff is there. What I also get is I get a low point that's past the golf ball. I don't get low points that are in front of the golf ball. I get low points that are past the golf ball, which means I'm getting ball first contact. And so all of a sudden now, the things that I really want to pay attention to that are going to control my six iron going a certain distance is this right here. Where's my impact point on the face? A whole lot better. Where's my low point? A whole lot better. Where's my speed? How does that? How is that delivered? And I'll talk to you about um, when we lose our spine angle or we lose our hip depth, or more importantly, when we don't bow correctly, um, what happens to the path? Well, path, path drops a little bit inside, the low point drops back, and all of a sudden now I take club head speed, it runs into the earth before it runs into the golf ball, and all of a sudden the delivered club head speed is a lot lower than, it, uh, than the speed of the club before it struck the ground, okay? So... Same thing, not, not full blast. And I feel a lot more weight in the heel there. Be curious to see what goes on. This started left and it spun to the right. What was the delivery of the path on that one? There you go, 3.3. So you start to see the consistency happen. It's not as much as when I'm exaggerating or doing the drill, but it is predictable. And now all of a sudden, again, another solid strike, another um, reliable shot shape. Okay. Now, when I amp this up, it may even come down a little bit more. Okay. The, the path, it may get into the twos here. So I'll try to heat this up a little bit. That was 110 ball speed and 78 miles an hour of club head speed. So now this is a, I don't want to say this is a full on delivery, but that's a really good one. Very good outcome. What's the path of the golf club there? This is fantastic because this is exactly what I said to you is going to happen. So all of a sudden, when I did the drill, 
I was 7.2 one time, five and four. This one drops to 0.4 out to in. Now it definitely is out to in because the ball started to the left and it curved to the right. That ball started to the left. Go ahead and show the um, the up front one there, Gibbsy, if you could. And maybe you don't have a camera available yet. So when that camera gets available, here you go. So that one there started to the left two degrees and spun to the right. Again, a lot of spin, 6,000 RPMs of spin, which means I got it low on the on the face. It's exactly what I'm trying to do. So I got my six iron with 6,000 RPMs of spin. It launched at about 18, eight, call it 19. And what I end up getting is very predictable shots. But what I also got was a, a path that wasn't as much out to in as I got when I had my, my uh, rear on this butt board, okay? So I know that when I did that, I got to do more. Now, I'm going to bow again. So that time I really bowed, over-exaggerated. This one started now at 3.9. So my guess is, is that that one there, yeah, there you go. So increased a little bit, 2.6 in the uh, in the out to in. So I've got control now over the club. And what's fun is, is that, and I mean this, for you, for me, we don't have to be absolutely three degrees out to in. We're not trying to hold it from the, from the fairway. I mean, we'd like to, but that's not necessarily something we're counting on. What we're counting on is predictability in what the club is looking like when it gets to the golf ball, where's the low point, all those things that I talked to you about before. That's what we're, we're hoping for. And what we need is we need a path that's out to in or in to out. It doesn't have to be exactly the same number every single time. It has to be in the ballpark. It has to be in the neighborhood, which is exactly what's going on when we do this. Now, uh, a few other things before we open this up to questions, okay? The first thing is this. When I bow for me individually, when I bow properly, what I have to feel like when I bow is not exactly what's going on when I bow. And bowing is a, is a sort of more formal way of saying forward bend, okay? Not side bend, but forward bend. When I bow, what I want to feel for me individually, let's go down the line, if you, or face on rather, Gibbsy. Yeah, when I bow, I want to, I'm actually thinking about bowing over my left leg. And when I bow over my left leg and I go like this, now my head moves forward. Now my rear goes back. And now I have lowered the head so I'm able to compress the golf ball. It's not where it happens, but it's where I feel like it's happening. So when I get over this ball and I'm thinking about hip depth, I'm thinking about bowing over that lead leg right here. And now what I get is I get a really good shot that starts to the left of the flag and spins back to the, to the target. If you're an individual that wants to hit draw, you still need bowing. But what you need to pay attention to is where you have to bow in order to get the low point forward, but get the ball to start out to the push side. So logic would say, well, I want to feel like I'm bowing to my trail leg. For me, that doesn't work because I'll hit it fat. So I'll bow on this one to my trail leg here and then go. So here we go. I hit that fat. Now, what you're going to see on the path here is that this club is really, really from the inside. There you go. Six degrees from the inside. So at that point, it's six degrees from the inside with an iron, not teed up. All of a sudden, I'm going to hit it fat. So what I want is I want this to come from the inside. And this is the difference between a cut swing and a draw swing. Cut swings will typically, provided that I have uh, a forward movement out of that bow, cut swings will move the low point forward. Draw swings will tend to move the, the um, low point backward, okay? And if you bow and you get a path that is down, I'm going to just say uh, when I'm coming in, I, I'm bowing right over the, the trail foot and I have a six degree path into out, 
my low point will get literally inches behind the golf ball, six, five, six inches. I'm, and I will fat it like you can't believe. So when I try to hit a draw, what I actually try to do is bow to the golf ball. And when I bow to the golf ball, I get what I feel is a forward movement. It doesn't, but it feels like that. And I get the path of the golf club to be more in the twos and threes. So now that path is going to start that out to the, the push side there. So you can see that one there is, is um, right of the target. And now we come over here and actually I got that one a little bit sick. So not bad. That wasn't bad. That's better than I've done. Let's try this again. That was better than I've done. Let's try it again. So bow to the ball. That's what I'm doing for a draw. That one was peppered. Let's see what the path was on that one. Gibbsy, come on over here and let's see what we got. That one there, we got a we got a, a, a spin number that was a little bit off, but 5.1. So that's actually working. So I've gotten a little bit better with this bow. Now, I want to go back to my shot shape. So now I'm going to drill. And I get in here like this. I'm not hitting this full again. This is just drill. And I have still a very difficult time keeping that, that hip back. Now, the reason why is I haven't done this a lot. This is, this is one of my projects. What was my end out there? Yeah, almost five. So good. So, But I haven't done this a lot. So what I have to do is I got to work on getting that hip to get back against this, this board. And as I start to get this back to this board, now all of a sudden, I start being able to deliver some consistencies. The only bad strike I've had was when I bowed to that, to that trail leg. And what I would ask you to do is work on this so that you can determine where you have to bow and do it up against a wall, okay? Now, let me just hit one a little full and see how I can do. And you may even hear this board or the PVC pipe hit that wall. This is gonna be a little faster. So that path there is gonna be, it's gonna be out to in, no question. That ball started to the left of the target. It's gonna be out to in and it's out to in 3.2, which is what I was telling you before that I get when I swing at a little faster speed and still trying to do this. I don't necessarily get that all the time yet when I'm uh, swinging without the butt board. But my point is, is that with a little bit of practice, what you realize is you can develop that consistency and strike that you're searching for. And what I can tell you is, is that universally, without a question of a doubt, this is the most essential part of motion that, that um, and I'm not talking about club face now, I'm just talking about path. It's the most essential part of uh, developing a consistent path in your golf swing. Because when you start taking your, your rear and sending it backwards, now all of a sudden the club starts to have the consistency of strike that you're looking for. And what you end up getting, and this is fun, is any movement back is better than what you're doing. And if you do too much of it, it's still fine. This is one of the rare times where some is good and more is better. Doesn't happen all the time, but this is one of those. The more you can get into this position where you're pushing back against this, gives you down the line, yeah. The more you can get pushing back this way and bowing over here this way, the more you're going to drop your head, the more you're going to lean the shaft, the more you're going to deliver less loft, the more you're going to strike it in the center of the club face, and the more consistency and predictability you're going to get out of your shot. So don't be afraid to do this too much. You can do it as much as you want. You have to figure out where you have to bow, what the bowing feels like. That's what the purpose of the drills are. One of the things that I, you know, that I, I enjoy doing is um, sort of prescribing drills. Because what happens is one thing to say, okay, you need to, to get more um, bowing in your, you need to get more hip depth. You need to get more forward bend. It's one thing to say, but that to me is like water's wet. How do I do it, coach? How do I do it? Here's how you do it. You get yourself this pillow. You hold it up. So in the down the line, you got about five, six inches right here. You make sure that when you're bowing, you're getting this to your thigh. Boom, just like that. 
and make sure that your butt's going backwards. So if you feel like you're almost dropping down that part of your back that we talked about before, that mid back, that's just going straight down. And that's how you're getting down into that. Then you get that club and you feel the same thing. Boom. Boom. Now you do that a little bit and then we get one. Now we're going to paste one here and then we're going to get to some questions. So we're getting in here like this. Feel that forward bend, that bowing rear going back. That one I just went after. Just say, you know what? Let's just give this a shot. 122 ball speed on that one. Now, what did I do with the path on that? So this one was fast, as fast as I can, can get. My club base was a little bit shut on that. 1.1 out to in. And so as I said to you before, as long as I get out to in today, because I'm, I'm just starting the journey, today, I couldn't be happier. I can swing at it hard, 122 miles an hour ball speed. I didn't really deliver the face the way I wanted to, but I, I delivered the path how I wanted the path to be delivered. And as a result, I struck the ball first. You're not going to get 122 miles an hour ball speed with a six iron without getting ball first contact, which is what happens. So I personally have to think about bending or bowing to that forward leg. And when I get that, I deliver the speed that I want. I, I start delivering the, the club the way I want. I got to get that club face a little bit more open on that. And that's just something that's going to happen with practice. Okay. All right, Gregory, let's get to some questions here. Okay. First of all, this one from, uh, from Anthony. When bowing, should I feel like my left hip as a right-handed golfer uh, should be going toward the target? No. So it will go towards the target. You don't need to think about it going towards the target, okay? So this is what you got to, this is the part you got to understand. So let's go face on here for a second, okay? So I'm going to take this part of the PVC pipe that has a cap on it. That's my left hip. This is the right hip. When I turn back, just pivot back, and I go like this. This part has moved back that way. It's moved out that way, but it's moved back that way as well. So when it starts to go back, back that way it's naturally going to go forward it has to go forward it's not going to go like this because then i have to move the whole pipe back that way for it to not go forward so my arm has to move so that it doesn't go forward if i just pivoted around a fixed axis it's going to start going forward yeah it's going to start going backward but it's going forward so you don't need to think about it going forward what you need to do is think about it going backward because when you go backward here Look at the pocket of my pant. When I go this way, there's a space between the pocket of my pant and that PVC pipe. When I start to go this way, that's actually going to get, there's a part there in the start where it's going forward. And then the next thing is, is that as we start trying to deliver something in that direction, the golf ball, the golf club, there will be a natural inclination for you to, to bump. So you don't need to think about it. Okay. In here like this. Now you, now you just bow. Everything moves forward, and then you rotate through, okay? All right, go ahead. Okay, this one is from Michael in Ohio. Uh, I started keeping my lead shoulder more closed through impact. It worked. Better contact, no weak fades. However, my miss is now a pull hook or an overdraw. Uh, how do I even this out? Okay. So I got to go to this one thing with tiger again so that you can see this because this is really a very important part of what makes tiger so special this is the the delivery down now here's what happens when you start thinking about shoulders so what you can see with tiger's shoulder is that it's actually internally rotated so let me show you what i mean by that if i stand here and i take this shoulder i can move it without moving my sternum and it they both can collapse in like this my sternum doesn't move but my shoulders are moving and they can only move in you can move them out a little bit you can move them back but it's not like you're going to dislocate your shoulder and it's going to go that way it can rotate inward so what happens is is that when you're doing what you're doing and you're keeping it it closed like this you're actually now you've got your shoulder into a, a pretty severe internal rotation or that 
move there and you've frozen your sternum. Okay. And so what happens is, is that when you get back to here and then you keep this internally rotated, your sternum doesn't move at all. And now whatever bowing is taking place is happening back here. And now you're going to hit pull hooks. But the fun part is, is that your path is still out to the push side. The pull hook is becoming, is coming from the club face being so closed. And when that club face gets closed, because this shoulder is frozen, now you have to flip the face. And so what you want to do is if, if I was coaching you, what I would say is, yeah, I'm with you on what you're doing. But what I would suggest doing is taking the trail shoulder. And as that trail shoulder is coming through, I want you to feel like that trail shoulder is going lower. Now, what it will do when it goes lower is you'll still be able to rotate the chest, but it slows it just a fraction because it's now seesawing. So if I wanted, if I wanted to take you and get you into away from hitting pull hooks, I would just go, okay, great. Just kind of feel like your shoulder, your trail shoulder is going to go down. And what you're going to get is you're going to get a nice little soft draw. You're not going to get pull hooks. You'll get soft draws. Because when you start to seesaw that thing, now all of a sudden you're taking a little rotation out. But because your shoulder is going down low, it's still going forward. It's just going forward a little bit, not a lot. But you need to have your chest open. And so when this goes down, your chest opens up. So what I would tell you is, don't think about that shoulder. Think about the trail shoulder and think about that trail shoulder getting a little bit more down and you'll, you'll uh, slow the rotation of the sternum, but you'll still get rotation in that sternum. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Gregory. Okay. This one from Robert. Um, I'd like to hit a fade with my irons, but I'm always worried about how much the club face should be open. Can you show a close up of your six iron and how open it is say compared to a wedge? Okay. So, um, my club face, and I, I could show you how much it's open, but it's marginal. It really is. It's marginal. What I'm doing more than that is I'm just keeping it marginally open. Okay. Now, the fun part is that when you have an open face, you can swing as far to the pull side as you want. Okay. I'm going to show you a real dramatic. I'm going to keep the club face just slightly open. I'm not going to, I'm not going to intend. And by the way, I'm not a robot here. So I don't want you guys to think that I'm just going to do this. This is, this is live. So this, I hope is going to happen, but it might not happen the way I kind of designed it. Okay. So you got to work with the live, the live set. We've already seen a little bit of that earlier today. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just swing this club so far to the left. I hope I don't hit that, that, uh, PVC pipe. So I'm going to swing this really far to the left. That should work with the club face just modestly open. So what I got there was now come on up to the front here, Gibbsy. So bring four up here or, or somebody up here because I want to show. So that ball launched out at 14 degrees. As I've already explained to you before, when I swing left, my launch is somewhere between 17 and 19 degrees. So when I get a 14, that means my angle of attack is really steep. I don't know what that angle of attack was there, uh, Greg, but it was it, it's steep because that launched out very, very low. How steep was that? Nine and a half. Nine and a half. So typically what I'm going to get with a six iron is more in the neighborhood of like six or seven degrees in the angle of attack. Nine and a half, that's three, that's probably three, nearly four more degrees to the left and downward rather downward than I normally get. So I'm going to get a little bit of a lower launch. My apex there is at 67. The, the, that's a lot lower. My spin rate went up to 6,500. That's a tremendous amount of spin. And though I delivered pretty good club head speed, the ball speed is going to come down because the collision is not great. And the spin is a lot greater when I hit it because it's going to be spinning sort of off the side. So it's not really a head on collision. It's more of a, an off center collision. And so I bring Pretty good club head speed, but I get poor ball speed because I'm swinging so far to the left. But pull that shot full, Gibbsy, if you could. And what you're going to see is that ball started down the left-hand side, and it only moved over to the right a marginal amount. Not a lot. But I was, I was open, and I went 
wicked left, as they say, 5.1 degrees. I went to the left-hand side. That's a lot more than I'm normally uh, moving that club to the left. And the reason why that's important for you is you need to realize that you can swing as far to the left as you want to swing, and you're not going to get a tremendous amount of curve. What gives you all the curve is the openness of the face, not the left path. Let me say that again. The more this club face is open, the more side spin I'm going to get, regardless of the path. So what you want is you want the face marginally open and then go as far left as you want. Now, with a more lofted club like a pitching wedge, it's not going to make a huge difference at all. If I take a pitching wedge here and I swing and I don't have, uh, do I have this taped? I do have this taped. So if I swing this to the left, you are not going to see a lot of curve because the amount of backspin I'm going to have is going to be way greater than 6,500. And that backspin is going to trump the side spin. So I won't get a tremendous amount of curve. I won't get as much as that. So this club face is a little bit open. I'm going to swing this thing violently to the left. So this will be just a real vicious pull. I got more side spin on the on that one. The side spin that I got on the first one was about 389. Look at this number right here. So the side spin that I delivered was 749 RPMs of, of side spin there. 700, it's almost twice as much. Almost twice as much. Now, what was that, that uh, path across? 4.3. So about the same. The angle of attack was 9.9. .9. That's about the same. So these are about the same with a wedge and a six iron. But I want you to look at that, pull that one full, Gibbsy. And what you can see is, is that that one didn't curve at all. Even though it had twice as much side spin, it didn't curve at all. Why? Because go ahead back to those, those numbers over here. The backspin that I had on the six iron was 6,500. This one is 9,000. So what happens is, is that my spin ratio goes down because I have so much backspin. That backspin now all of a sudden helps to wash away the 750 RPMs of, of side spin that I got. And as a result, I only have a, a spin ratio of 8.3. And that spin ratio of 8.3, now all of a sudden I'm not going to get a tremendous amount of curve. That's going to curve just a very little amount. So my point is this, that when you have, and I, I would say this, I would say nine iron down, swing left, aim straight. Eight iron, seven iron, six iron, five iron, swing left, aim left for a right-handed golfer, okay? But nine iron down to the sand wedge, swing left, swing to the left, but aim straight because it's not going to curve. It's not going to curve a lot. Okay. All right. Next one. All right. This is um, a follow up from Robert again, uh, which I feel like we need to get into here. Does okay. the same apply to the driver? Right now, I'm hitting driver fades by putting the ball a little forward and leaving my shoulders open a little. Well, what you're doing when you put the ball, when you put the driver forward, is you now alter the path a little bit because your shoulders are going to get a little bit more open. And so the path of the golf club will be a little bit more out and over. So when you close those with the, the driver, it's the ball positions influence is enormous. It goes back to something that Greg, you and I have talked about for a while. One of my great debates is which is more important, the grip or the ball position. And I can argue ball position, I can argue grip, but I can argue ball position quite effectively. And this is one of those times because as you start taking that ball position and getting it forward, now the path of the golf club is gonna to start to be a little bit more out to in. And so when you keep the shoulders closed, you make that path a little less out to in. You could simply do the same thing by working on rotating, but just don't move the ball that far forward. So what I would say to you is all you're describing is a forward ball position there. And now you've taken a swing thought, which you can apply to a forward ball position. And it helps to bring the path in a little bit more straight. It still fades, but a little bit straighter. Okay. All right. Okay. This one from Alan. Uh, I'm struggling with my grip. And I watched the video talking about the grip, but I end up with a strong left hand, four knuckles. 
Uh, I hit it more solid, but is that too strong? So you're hitting it solid. What, what, what kind of shot shape is Allen getting? I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's, if you're gripping it that strong, right? Cause I'll, I'm gripping this, I'll grip this strong and I'm going to hit this and see if I can't make this thing uh, cut a little bit. So there you go. That cut a lot of it. So all you have to do, I, I, I need you to understand this because this is a really important thing. Okay. So I was, I was with my sons at hockey practice and Greg, you probably understand this a lot more. And the guy said, how do you, which hand controls where you want to shoot the puck? And I was kind of sitting there going, I don't, I don't know. And he said the top hand, and I wasn't talking to me. He was talking to the kids, but he said the top hand, if I want to shoot, go down the line, Gibbsy. If I want to shoot over to the, to the right side of the net, I'm going to take my handle and I'm going to get the upper part of it over to that side. In effect, I've shifted the path of that. And if I want to go left, I let my hand go back here, my upper hand go back. And now it takes the path that makes it go over to the left-hand side. So the handle itself is a really important part of what goes on and the upper hand. So if I have a really strong grip and I take my handle and I get it forward, I open up the club face. Okay. And so when you start doing that, now all of a sudden, as long as that handle stays way ahead of the club head, my club face can open up. It closes when I bring it back that way. So if I take a really strong grip, I've got to make sure to be effective. I've got to make sure that that handle is really far forward when it comes to the ball. And when I do that, now what I get is this one here has just a little bit of a brush cut, but launch gets a little bit lower. There's a lot of things that change. And so what you need to appreciate is if you're going to play with a strong grip, which is fine, you've got to offset that by making sure that handle, the top part of the handle stays way ahead of the club head. And when that starts to happen, you're now taking the club base and you're opening it up a little bit. Okay. So Alan hits a draw, but sometimes a hook. So the question is, would you rather just turn the grip back a little bit? Or would you rather work on what you just well that's what i so what i would say is i would say okay if you're hitting hooks the top part of that handle isn't far enough down the line so you've got to get the top part of that handle farther down the line so that top part of the handle is going to be way up here to do that it'll give you a little bit more distance too that's what i would tell you to do okay you got to understand where the top part of that handle is in space in order for you to to um affect grips that's one of the reasons why i talk about this a lot uh, very weak grips create open faces. And when you have a very weak grip, now all of a sudden to get that club face to get back to where you want it, you got to take the top part of that grip and you got to stop it. You don't let, if you carry the top part of that grip, now the club face is way open. And now you've moved to Shanksville. Okay. Nobody wants to live in Shanksville. So what you do is you now start trying to close that. And so you occasionally visit Shanksville. You don't have a house, but you go there every once in a bit just because you like the neighborhood. Get out of that neighborhood. Okay, change the grip, get stronger, let that handle get up there and you'll get away from hitting hooks. But also, too, you'll start to be able to get a lot straighter and a lot more distance. Okay, all right. All right. I'm going to ask um, a similar topic from two different people. So Michael says, do you tilt your shoulders still with the driver? And Ava says, does the butt board bow drill still work with the driver? Yeah. Okay. So good question. So. Um, with, with regards to the driver, do you still, you still want that, that rear to go back? Well, rather than me telling you what I think, let's just go and look at the very best, do what the very best does. So this is with a driver and he hit a draw. Okay. He's up at the top of the swing here and now watch what happens with his body. It drops down, the butt pushes back, extends back. It's still extending back. And now what we get is we get the tilting of the shoulders because when he's bowing, he's bowing back. And so if I bow, if I bow back here, what I get is side bend. So I like to call it a bow 
because when I bow forward, I don't get a lot of right side bend. I get more lead side bend, okay? When I bow back here, I'm going to get more trail side bend. Still feel like I'm bowing, but the more back here I am, the more trapped I get, the more side bend I get, the more the path goes out from uh, in, or into out. And so the answer is yes and yes, right? I still want to feel like I bow. It's where am I bowing? And if I if I set up with those shoulders the way you should like this, and I get in here and I bow, I'm going to get more side bend because I start with a little more side bend because the, the inclination of the, of the shoulders there. So I get to where my trail shoulder is well underneath my lead shoulder. And now I come through here and I get into that bend. I'm still going to be more in side bend. Go down the line, Gibbsy, if you would. I'm still in more side bend right here because I started with more side bend. You don't lose that side bend unless you let your hips slide. Once you let your hips slide back this way, now you get, when the hips slide, now you get into some forward side bend. Don't do that. All right, go ahead. All right, this one from CLW. I'm struggling with a path that is too far inside to out, resulting in a miss that is severely hooked. Uh, do you have any tips to at least get a more neutral path? Yeah, okay. So this is, this is exactly, like this would be the script for um, solving the problem. You need more, you need more lead side bend through your strike. So my favorite drill, and it really is, I mean, as long as Greg has worked with me, I've done this drill and it helps me with my bowing and it helps me with my bowing to my lead foot. I take the golf ball. I put it outside of my beautiful Bermuda shoes. I put it outside that and I put it inside the strike line. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this golf ball, but I'm going to make sure that it doesn't hook. Okay. And as you start to do that, you start to feel control over the club face, but also too, you are, you start to feel like, well, I'm over the top, which is what we have to have happen. Right? So I get in here like this, and now I'm going to hit this ball and I'm not going to let this curve to the left. And so that golf ball starts out to the right and it spins or starts out to the left rather and spins over to the right. And what I feel when I do that is I feel a lot of side lead side bend and rotation through there. And that's when I start to get some bowing. Cause when you get up here and you get into that lead side bend, you're actually bowing forward. You're just positioning yourself over that lead foot, which is why I tell you, I bow over the lead foot. And so you start to feel that you keep doing that drill, maybe move it back just a little bit. So now the ball maybe isn't outside of your foot. Maybe it's right over, but it's still inside the strike line. And then same thing. We start out there and we keep that club face open hang on to the face and you keep doing this and doing this and doing this. And you start to get this feeling of your upper body is moving forward and it's also opening up. And that happens to be a swing thought that, that I carry with me. And I'm, I know it will help you as well. I want to feel the upper part of my body moving forward and opening up. And when it moves forward and opens up, now I get some lead side bend. Now I get the club working out and over. Now my club face is in a pretty good position because of what I've done both pre-swing and in-swing. And now all of a sudden, I might even get a little bit of a shot that starts out and has a little bit of a cut spin to it. This one is right on my target, exactly what I was trying to hit. So yeah, do that drill. I, I'm telling you, it worked for me. I used to be a, I used to massively hook the golf ball, particularly under pressure. And now I don't do that. I don't, I don't, because I know that I can cut the ball. I don't feel the pressure. I just over i just exaggerate that that swing a lot and what i get i lose a little distance i gain a little bit more shot shape but what i get is a ball that starts left and fades right and i can do it under all kinds of pressure so go ahead okay this one from alfred uh, i have a timeshare in shanksville do we have any tips to get rid of <laughs> do we have any tips to get rid of that timeshare that's so good yeah all right so let me do this so I'm going to remove this shoe. And by the way, you, those of you that have joined me, please get, get in on this, um, this foot joy shoe thing that, that we've got going on. It's so fun. You can design your own. Just go over to my joys. So here's what I do down the line. If you would Gibbsy. Okay. So I take a box. This shoe happens to have one shoe in it. I take a box and I put that ball 
close to the box. So I'm sure I got a close up here coming soon from you there, Gibbs. Yeah, great. And so what I have is I have, if I strike this box, I'm going to hit it in the hosel. So I'm going to set the ball up. It's about one golf ball inside that box. And what I do is I don't swing to hit the ball. I swing to miss the box. So I want to take the club and have the club come through here and not touch that, that box with it. So I start little chips. And all I'm doing is missing the box. I'm not thinking about hitting the golf ball. I'm thinking about missing the box. And what you're going to see is, is that probably, at least from the feel of it, I don't know. Yeah, it's not picking it up. So from the feel of it, it feels like it's right out on the toe. <laughs> and then what do I feel like I'm doing in order to miss that? Well, one of the things I feel is I feel like a real connection between my triceps and my rib cage. So when I come through here, those are connected. So now what I do is I'll get that box out of the way, bring this in here. And I might even use, like this time, a little tennis ball, right? And I'll put a tennis ball right here like this, so it'll allow me to swing a little faster. I won't worry about if I hit the tennis ball, it's just, I just hit the tennis ball. But now I'm really focusing on feeling my triceps staying connected to my chest. And now all of a sudden what I get, I feel, again, I felt like that was a little bit in the toe or towards the toe, but it didn't come out of the, the hosel of the, the golf club, okay? Now, this is the beauty of what, what I have available to me, is now I videotape it. So I set this thing up like this, close to that tennis ball, and now I feel that tricep connection. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to see how I did here. So club comes down, and there it is. It's out on the toe. Boy, that's a lot more out on the toe than I thought it was. I couldn't be any more out on the toe there. If you take a look at that, Gibbsy, pull that full. I mean, that is as much out on the toe as you can get. I almost toe shanked it. So that's what, that's what I do. I record it, and that's what I'm telling you to do. Do bring a tennis ball in there. Just get a tennis ball cut in half. You can't believe how effective that is, by the way, as an instructional tool. Just get a tennis ball, cut it in half, put put it in your in your golf bag, and you can use those pieces for path. You can use it for balance. You can use it for heel pressures. You can use it for a lot of different things. So it will really help you. And you can also use it so you can sell that timeshare in Shanksville. All right, go ahead. Uh, this one's for David. Both of my heels tend to lift up in transition why does this happen and how can i become more stable okay well now that's a that's a really good one so um when you start to lift the heels in transition what happens is is that you haven't go ahead down the line you haven't put any pressure in in the heels in the backswing which is again where this butt board comes in so when you get set up give yourself a little space in here and when you make a backswing, I want you to feel like you're going to take your, your hip, push it back so that your butt touches this thing. And then when you swing, I want you to feel like the other one's going to get on there. And when you start to feel like you're swinging this way, now all of a sudden your heels are going to feel like they're, they're on the ground. The reason why it, it changes is because when you start swinging and you don't load that, your body then falls out to the toes you are probably on your toes before you start doing anything. And then when you start swinging down, now all of a sudden you have no pressure in the heels. So you now can, you now can jump because all your weight's out on the toes. But that happened well before that. That happened in the backswing because you didn't get any hip depth. So you have to have hip depth in the backswing. So the way you do that is, again, at your house, you have a wall. You leave yourself some space, cross your hands, make a backswing, and sink that trail hip right into that wall. Just sink it in there. And then when you get to here now, sink that other one in there. So you sink, sink, and go, and you'll start to feel the, the heel getting into that ground. Okay? All right, go ahead. Okay, this one from Braden. 
Why is my mid iron miss a pulled shot? So by mid iron, this is a very, this is a, an interesting one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to ask him the question. I'll answer the question after he responds, but what is your definition of a mid iron? Is the mid iron a six iron, seven iron, eight iron is the miss uh seven iron, six iron, five iron. Okay. And that's a, that's an important thing. Like what's your definition of the, the mid iron now? Six, seven, eight, six, seven, eight. Okay. So what you start getting there is you haven't gotten to where um, the six iron to me is the, and the reason why I practice with the six iron, the six iron to me is the club that has the least amount of, of the least amount of loft and the most amount of loft to where you start to get a register of, of side spin and back spin as they work together to create a shot shape. Okay. But when you get to seven irons and eight irons, they're kind of stiff in that nine iron. That's when you've got enough loft to where the golf ball isn't going to really spin a whole lot. It will spin, uh, or I should say not spin, but curve a whole lot. It may spin more, but it doesn't curve a whole lot because you have so much backspin to help you. Okay. Now, why do we create pulls? So our word of the day today, by the way, was why. So why do I get this? So first of all, pull, the term pull implies a path. Pull implies path, but a ball that doesn't curve tells you that the face is over there. So if I take my six iron and I pull, but I pull with a straight face, now all of a sudden there's a pretty straight pull. Boom, hit the tree. That was actually a good pull. Pulled that one. That only had 200 RPMs of left spin. So there's not a lot of curve in that. That's the pull. All right. Now, when we now take the face and get the face a little bit more open as I come through, but I still pull. What was the path on that, Greg? Did you did you get a chance to see that? Yeah, it was 6.2. 6.2. So I'm 6.2 of pull. Now, here's a little bit more pull open face. Ah, it didn't register. Let's try it again. Is that in the green there? Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to pull open face. Okay. So here's pull open face. Now let's pay attention to what that path is because that ball is going to curve back and we'll show you that fully. What's that path? 6.8. 6.8. So they're virtually identical in the paths. The shots were completely different. Pull that shot if you would. Um, gives a full. And what you can see is that ball started left and it faded back to the right. Now that's a pretty good shot. You wouldn't call that necessarily a pull. You'd call that a fade, but you can't hit a fade without a pull path. What happens is, is that you have an open face to path. And so in order for you to make a pull path effective, what you have to do is you have to have the face aligned correctly. Now, Back to eight irons and, and seven irons, eight irons and seven irons with all that loft, you got to make sure that that club face is going to be a little bit more open because if it's not and it goes on the pull path, there's not enough side spin to bring it back. So what I would tell you, with the simple thing to do when you get to where you have those mid irons and you are, you're clearly going to hit a little bit of a fade, it's just not fading, here's what you're going to do. You're going to just grip it a little bit more open. That is, that is the quick tip. The quick tip, just grip it a little more open. And when you grip it a little more open, you'll still make the same swing that you're doing. And all of a sudden that thing is going to curve back to the, back to the target. Okay. All right, here we go. Okay. From Ricky, um, when I'm hitting off a soft ground, should I club up? I always seem to chunk slash take big divots with my wedges. Okay. So now we're with wedges. Okay. So, um, this is always a fun one because if Ricky, if you were with me, we would do this in a question and answer. It would be a Q and a type type thing here. Okay. So I would say to you, why do you chunk it? And you're going to say, well, I hit behind the ball and I'm going to say, okay, well, why are you hitting behind the ball? And you say, I don't know. 
And I would say, okay, well, how can you make sure you you don't hit behind the ball? And you would say, well, I don't know. And I would go, okay, so what if we took the ball and we moved the ball backwards, back away from it? And what do you think that would, what do you imagine would happen? And you, your, your response is probably going to be, well, if I move the ball back, I probably am getting the ball closer to where the bottom of the arc is happening. So I would say, okay, so let's try that a little bit. Let's move it ball. Let's move the ball back a little bit. Now, one of the things that is true, Ricky, is this: I don't know where you have the position of your golf ball, but what I see out of people that chunk is they do one thing mechanically, or they don't do one thing mechanically, and that is they don't get any body rotation. So you get yourself a, a, a pitching wedge like this, and what you do is you bend over a little bit more, and you don't rotate. You don't turn your body in the backswing. And as a result, you pick the club up and you create a steep angle of attack. And so that steep angle of attack is now our chop into the ground. And then there's probably a couple other things that are going on as well that's causing you to ground out before you get to the, to the golf ball, okay? So, but what I would tell you first is we got to make sure that we get some rotation here. So that would be back to that butt board. I want to feel like my trail hip is smacking up against that wall. Teach myself to rotate back here. So I get my pitching wedge and I'm going to rotate back here like this. And then I'm going to hit it. The second thing that you're going to do is you're going to move your ball position back. So the combination of the ball being back and the body rotating a little bit more. Now we're going to have a little bit shallower angle of attack. Greg, when I hit that shot, we, did you happen to see what the, the angle of attack on that was? Because I guarantee you that that's going to be less than five degrees. What is it? 3.7. Yeah, there you go. So 3.7 degrees. Now, remember when I had my six iron, I had nine and change. Now, most times, pitching wedges are going to have steeper angles, angles of attack than a six iron. But because I moved the ball back, my shoulders get a little more closed. I get a little bit more body rotation. The club is coming a little bit shallower. Did you happen to see what that was, where that was coming from the inside? It's probably coming from the inside Four, by 4.7. Yeah. So there you go. So with a pitching wedge, with the ball back, I still have the club's going to come from the inside. I've got much more rotation. So it shallows out the club, but also too, it's not so dramatically from the inside that I can't get the, the club on the ball. It's from the inside, but not dramatically. And so what I would say to you is this one, you got to turn a little bit more, move that ball position back as a second thing. And now you'll start to get out of those chunks and you'll start getting that distance off of the, off the, the wedge that you expect predictability. Okay. All right. Okay. This one from Emilio. Um, my left shoe spins out after impact. I'm not trying to compete in long driving competitions. I want this to stop. And how do I keep from doing that? You know, this is always an interesting question, right? So we start, we start looking at this through a, a lens of why is this a problem? And early on in my career, I used to pay a lot of attention to what was going on with the left foot, the lead foot. Because I was taught, as many people were that are my age, 61, that that foot has to stay planted on that ground there. And nowadays, what we see a lot of is we see a lot of moving out of that foot. So the, the first question I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you is, why is that a problem? Like if you're striking the ball, if you're spinning out and you're hanging back and your low point is too far behind the ball and you're making poor contact, okay, now we got a problem. But if it's just, hey, my left foot spins out, I still hit it, it's fine, but I, my left foot, okay, so, so what? Don't worry about it. Now, let's assume it's a problem and it's leading to, to bad stuff. What I would tell you is this. What you have to do in order for you to get that foot from not, from not spinning out is you got to feel like you got some weight going on to that because you got to put weight into that ground there. So what I would tell you is, is you got to think about this through the lens of um, a Gary player. Gary player always thought that, that when you swung, you should be able to walk through to the target. Well, you can't walk through to the target if that foot's spinning out. So what you got to do is you got to get to where you do this drill where you swing and walk. So we're in here like this. Swing and walk. Get another ball and just swing and walk. And what you find out is, hey, in order for me to swing and walk, I got to shift over there. So now 
Okay, now we're not going to swing and walk, but we're going to shift over there. So we get in here, and now we shift over there. Hey, my foot didn't spin out. Hey, this can work. So what you want to do is you want to do the walkthrough drill for a period of time, and then you just want to feel the shift. Don't walk, just shift. And then eventually you're going to start to feel how that, that foot is pushing into the ground and how your body is, is moving to make that happen, okay? All right, listen. You know I love doing this stuff, and I love being able to interact and help you all play better golf. And the interaction, as always, continues to be great. And so what we ask is, is that you tell your friends about what we're doing. We gained another 100 followers again, so we're 42-2. And what I'm hoping to do is get to 42-3 and 42-4. If we can get 100 every single week, we're that much closer to our goal of 100,000 people. So tell your friends about what we're doing over here. Subscribe to our channel and be a part of a new breed of golf live and all the things that we're doing here on YouTube. Also want to remind you, if you want to get a blessed poker chip ball marker, you want to get a hat or a, a uh, putter cover, anything from um, what we've got here to be a part of the community, just send an email to me at a new breed of golf at michaelbreed.com. We can take care of, of all of that for you too. And what I also want to remind you is what we've got going on with foot joy. You look at these shoes that we've got here. These things are so pretty. Look at this. Gives you see that one right there, that USA. I designed it myself. Put a little uh, blue shoelace in there. Got a little blue and red in the in the tongue. Be a part of our our My Joys Design Your Own Shoe program. We've got that going on for the next um, I don't know a couple months, but it takes a little while to get these shoes. It takes about three, four, five weeks to get the shoes. So get on the website. Go over to FootJoy.com. Start messing around with my joys. Click the my joys button and start messing around with designing your own shoe. When you get the shoe, take a nice picture with a big smile face. Hold that thing up. We're going to award 11 different people with all kinds of prizes, including golf gloves, lesson, and of course, uh, the grand prize winner is also going to get um, uh, three months rather with uh, Chris Finn from Par for Success. So it's gonna be a really fun program. We're having a great time designing these shoes and on all my social media feeds, we're gonna start uh, getting that out there. Be a part of this, this is really, really cool. And by the way, all the shoes that I'm designing, absent of a couple, I'm gonna give away um, to everybody. So be a part of it, I'm asking you, be a part of it because uh, it really is a fun thing and we appreciate FootJoy uh, being a part of it. Speaking of being a part of it, I wanna thank the two individuals that are a part of what we do. Steve Gibbs, Greg Ducharme, and ah, oh, you didn't let me down. That's fantastic. I love it. There's always that doubt. Make sure you join us here every single Thursday at noon Eastern. And also, too, join us on Sirius XM on a new breed of golf at 8 a.m. Eastern. Tomorrow, we're going to do some more instruction. We'll also talk a little bit about the first round of the Butterfield Bermuda Championship. For all of us here on a new breed of golf, I'm Michael Breed. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow and talking with you tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm.